Hello and welcome to Press TV News Analysis. I'm Kaveh Tahwai. The United States' land of free, especially freedom of expression, has experienced a few milestones this past week. OWS, Occupy Wall Street Movement, marked its one-year anniversary. A video emerged showing how U.S. presidential candidate Mitt Romney wrote off 47% of the U.S. population as Obama supporters in need of government aid, amongst other things. And this is while the week before, U.S. debt hit the $16 trillion mark and counting. More alarming, a poll revealed that a majority of Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. This is while Forbes released its list of millionaires. This in a land of freedom of expression where it's okay for an anti-Islam film to be produced, yet not okay for OWS protests, which resulted in over 100 arrests. A look at those stories in this edition of the news analysis, plus why Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been accused of interference in the U.S. presidential elections especially with his recent appearance in a TV ad. More gaffes from the U.S. presidential candidate Mitt Romney. This video, which recently surfaced on the Internet, shows Romney speaking at a fundraiser. All right, there are 47 percent who are with him who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never think that. Wow. Romney also once again targeted Palestinians, saying they are not interested in peace. Romney has on several occasions angered Muslim nations, including Palestinians, by describing Jerusalem al-Quds, the capital of Israel. His bias towards the Israeli regime has won him support from Tel Aviv. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has recently been accused of meddling in the U.S. presidential election in favor of Romney. The Israeli opposition says Netanyahu portrays U.S. President Barack Obama as weak on Iran. Romney himself has accused Obama of being soft on Tehran. The Obama campaign has quickly seized on Romney's latest gaffes, calling him unfit to serve as president. Meanwhile, anti-Wall Street movement that says both Republican and Democratic parties only serve the interests of the rich marked its first anniversary earlier this week with countrywide protests. Large numbers of people were arrested after New York police intervened to disperse the protesters. But the anti-Wall Street demonstrators say they will keep up the protests until things change. You know, it's, it's not the big flash in the pans that are going to make the change. It's these small little things and that we keep on coming out and we're not going anywhere. This is a movement in that it, it's only been a year. It's going to take many years for us to develop and figure out exactly who we are. But all we do know is that there's a broad banner of economic injustice that brings together all of our people. The protesters are accusing both the Democrats and Republicans for what they call the ills of America. They also charge that the two parties represent only 1% of the U.S. population, which wield the wealth and power in America. Recent opinion polls have shown many Americans now believe that the Democratic and Republican parties do a poor job and an independent third party is needed in the U.S. politics. Well, let me introduce our guest for this edition of the News Analysis, Executive Director of If Americans New, Alison Weir, joins us from Sacramento. We have Iraq war veteran Michael Preisner, who joins us from Los Angeles, and writer and political commentator Lawrence Freeman, who joins us from Washington. I'd like to welcome you all. Alison Weir, let me start with you. In developments from the U.S., I'm sure you've watched it, the Romney video, which has created some criticism. Maybe it has harmed his campaign insensitive, out of touch, or simply speaking the cold, hard truth. What do you think? 
Uh, the first two, insensitive and out of touch. Um, it's a shame that both candidates actually sort of write off the other half too often. Romney especially, of course, did that in this, uh, what he thought was a private conversation with funders. It was, it was uh, you know, what he said was not true. Um, I think if he spoke to a larger audience, he of course would not have said that, but it was revealing to see what he was saying to donors and disturbing. Uh, Michael Preisner, uh, let's do a little fact check regarding what he has said. Uh, it does fall uh, over the number of people who live on some form of government entitlement. But regardless, when we also uh, add that to millions who are on food stamp within that group, doesn't that mean that policies of both parties have been ineffective? Well, let's look at who Mitt Romney is actually talking about, this 47% uh, who are on entitlements, as, as he calls them. Um, and there was something, uh, a quote from his uh, saying on, on this issue, uh, talking about people receiving entitlements, where he said, they're never going to take responsibility. Um, and who is he talking about that's not taking responsibility? Uh, he's talking about people who are receiving Social Security benefits, uh, which you have to work and pay into for at least 15 years to receive. Uh, so how have those people not taken responsibility by working for, for more than a decade? Uh, he's talking about people who are unemployed through no fault of their own uh, because tens of thousands, really hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs have been eliminated uh, by big corporations because they feel that they cannot turn a profit. People who are desperately, desperately looking for work uh, and receive a small stipend been to be able to look for work, how are they not taking responsibility? Uh, he's talking about single mothers who break their backs working 80 hours a week, working multiple jobs, who on poverty wages still cannot make enough money uh, to put food on the table uh, and to be able to take care of their families. One in six people in this country uh, deals with hunger on a regular basis. He's saying that all of those people uh, who work very, very hard to try to get by are not taking responsibility, well, Mitt Romney and the wealthy donors that were in that room uh, do not bear one ounce of the responsibility uh, than that 47% that they're talking about. Those are good points made there, uh, Lawrence Freeman. And of course, uh, it's been stated that many Americans actually live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, this has come out in a report. And it was interesting, the timing of this report, because uh, Forbes released uh, actually its list of uh, millionaires, or should I say uh, billionaires, of which what was interesting was the uh, number that swayed either way, $100 million in either net gains or loss. But the more interesting part was that their net worth of these top 50, all over $1 billion, uh, one at the top of the list to be at $58 billion. What is your reaction when you hear that? Well, we know with the, that the United States right now is in a full-scale depression. It's not a recession. Uh, it's gotten worse under President Obama, who's carried out, unfortunately, the same policies that President Bush carried out, that $27-plus trillion has been given to the banks in Wall Street and the banks in the city of London. And right now, we're looking at the potential blowout of the European monetary system, the euro, which will drag down the U.S. further. So. Romney showed that the Republicans, and he doesn't really care about the people at all. He may be called anti-people, but he's doing a good job of working for the Obama campaign because Obama looks a little bit better when Obama is really no better at all. And in fact, Obama's policy in Syria and Iran and vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia is actually more dangerous, believe it or not, than the neocon policy of Romney. But the two parties are, are not serving the American people. We may go back to the original policies of George Washington and not have parties, because neither party is offering any leadership. Some individuals in the parties are. We're working with people in Congress to get Glass-Steagall legislation through and other legislation through uh, to limit Obama's ability to start another war in the Middle East. But the parties at the top and the leadership, they're corrupt. We should not pay any attention to them, and we have to come up with our own policies for the development of this country and the world, which are in serious, serious danger right now. Well, uh, since you're mentioning uh, Iran, I need to bring you in, Alison Weir, and get your thoughts on this recent ad that's featuring Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it says the current U.S. administration, namely Obama, is soft on Iran, and its aim, obviously, to promote Romney uh, before his trip to Miami. Does this 
I mean, it's something that's been accused, Israel has been accused of in terms of interference with the presidential race, especially the sad, which some say make it look, it makes it look like Netanyahu is also in the running. <laughs> that's uh, that's sort of true. Um, yes, it, it of course is interference in the presidential election. That's what's going on. Uh, the, but the, the many people are missing the point that there's nothing new in that. Israel has been interfering in domestic politics from the very beginning of its existence. That's how it has gotten um, over eight million dollars per day of American tax money being sent to Israel. 10,000 times greater than the average amount of foreign aid that we send abroad. It's because it is a domestic issue for American politicians because major donors and figures in the media are pro-Israel and they are pandering to that. So Netanyahu's recent actions, which are especially outrageous, uh, are a part of this, this tradition that most Americans, sadly, are not really aware of, but is a, a primary factor in elections in this country all the time, in national elections, in congressional elections, sometimes even in, in lower elections, Israel is a factor. Um, and it's attempt, uh, usually successful, to meddle in American politics. Well, th this uh, point about the uh, campaign money keeps coming up. Michael Preisner, let's uh, bring you in. Uh, I mean, uh, what is ruling the campaign in terms of the candidate of choice? Is it money? We know that there's only a handful of people that are contributing in the millions of dollars. Does it make it right for those handful of people to influence what affects hundreds of millions of Americans? Well, absolutely not. And I would say that that exposes the real sham democracy that we have here in the United States, where the presidential elections is a completely closed process that's open only to candidates who can receive uh, multi-million dollar donations. And really, uh, for the president, each candidate being able to raise um, probably about $2 billion or more in this presidential election. Um, having to have the backing of those big banks and big corporations and military contractors uh, that can foot the bill for these campaigns. Um, anyone who doesn't fall in line with the interests of these big donors um, simply has no chance in the election. Uh, the mainstream media, which is simply a mouthpiece for Washington and the Pentagon, uh, will follow in line also, um, only give airtime, only give credibility to those who are accepted mainstream candidates. Uh, you know, the majority of Americans right now, the majority of people living in the United States uh, do not have a lot of money. I mean, we have uh, about 150 million people who are officially living in poverty and below that, that official poverty line. And so we know that, that many more actually are living in extreme hardship. How can we possibly say uh, that this is a democratic country in the interests uh, of, by, and for the people when the vast majority of people in this country are dispossessed, are living on low wages, are living paycheck to paycheck, yet our elected representatives uh, are multi-millionaires? I mean, how does that translate in any way to a representative democracy? Uh, and in fact, it does not. Um, the democracy we have um, is a bourgeois democracy. It's a, it's a democracy for the very, very rich, and everyone else uh, is not allowed to have a voice except in that ballot voting for one of the two mainstream candidates. If they try to exercise real democracy, uh, which is fighting in the streets against these policies, uh, we are shut down and smashed uh, by the government, as we've seen with the Occupy movement. Just like you know, the U.S. has been pointing fingers at other countries doing the same thing, um, saying this is a reason that, that we must go intervene. Um, very similar to, to protests being crushed around the world. Uh, we see that here in the United States as well, uh, which is a, supposedly one of the most cherished rights under our Constitution and, and supposedly a, a key facet to democracy is the right to speech and the right to protest. Well, uh, since you're talking about demonstrations and protests, uh, uh, Lawrence Freeman, I mean, uh, this uh, was a week which marked the uh, one-year anniversary of OWS and the protesters did come out uh, peaceful uh, when it uh, started, but then what happened was that there were over 100 arrests made. So let's put it into perspective. Why does freedom of expression then exclude the right to protest like these protesters did, but yet it's okay, for example, to make a movie that insults Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, and as a result, one and a half billion Muslims to be enraged across the world? Well, first of all, I think you have to be reali realize that President Obama is right now taking the 
the dictatorial powers of Cheney and Bush and, and gone even further with the National Defense Authorization Act, which he could try to he can arrest people, Americans, and throw them in jail without any uh, due process. He's already killed Americans in his drone policy without any due process. He's violated the Constitution. So I don't think we should have any illusions that this administration uh, has any idea of what's pro-democratic. In fact, our administration is pushing the policy of regime change uh, around the world. And, I, and look, the situation with the Occupy Wall Street, I, they have a right inclination, but they're not functioning on what is actually demanded. We don't have years. We have weeks and months. This President Obama may start another war in the Middle East. And it's not Netanyahu pulling the strings. Obama has made clear to Netanyahu that, that they can carry on this dog and pony show. But he's told Netanyahu, we've gotten this from Israeli sources and also in the public domain in Israel, that Obama said, we will follow you in. General Dempsey, the chairman of Joint Caesar staff, is the only one who said, no, we do not want a war with Iran. I don't want to be part of it. We do not want a war with Syria. So Obama is really the provocateur. And my concern, my concern in my organization with Mr. LaRouche and ER Magazine is that this president will get us into war before or after the election. And if it's a war that's backed up by, with Russia and China, then it could be a, a nuclear war. So I think we have to have a reality check. The demonstrations are valid, but they're missing the point. We need an overall, of, an overhaul of this economic system. It's bankrupt. It's finished. It doesn't work anymore. We have to build projects of infrastructure projects like we had on the Roosevelt. We have to emphasize more funding for our space program. And we have to provide for the welfare of the people. Give them good paying jobs. Give them dignity. And that means having Glass-Steagall separation of the banks from the gambling casinos. We have a fully worked out program. But the problem is that the Republicans don't really like people, especially poor people. And Obama is in Never Neverland. In fact, Obama's funders are the same people that are funding Romney, Wall Street, and the same rich people he goes golfing with and he hangs out with. So right now, there's no difference between the two parties. They're both corrupt, and they're brainwashing the population, but I think we have to vote for either one. We have to fight for a real policy. But the immediate danger is Obama is out of control, and he could start a war. And if it's a nuclear war, then we're all in trouble. And that's what concerns me right now. Well, you talk about a reality check, Allison Weir. I thought that the reality check occurred, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, after the Iraq war and then what preceded. Uh, we could talk about the war in Afghanistan. We could even talk about Libya for it to be a reality check. Look at what happened there mm -hmm. last week. Uh, so uh, what is uh, the aim correct. of the U.S. getting into wars when we look at the perspective where the U.S. is preaching a democracy, which it seems, based on events that have happened in the past two weeks, this anger for example, on this uh, anti-Islam movie, not to mention the caricatures or the cartoons uh, that were published in France, is not so much against the entities created it, but rather the United States and its administration. The administration, don't forget. This is Alison Weir. Go ahead. lying, and Susan Rice is lying. Alison Weir, go ahead. Yes, one thing I'd, I'd like to to correct from the previous speaker, although so much that's been, been said, I of course agree with a great deal of it. Um, I, I don't think that we should categorize half the people in our country, which are Republicans pretty much, um, as saying that they don't like people. I, I think most Republicans, like most Democrats, do like people. Uh, I think the leadership has a certain mind and panders to a certain uh, approach, but I think uh, many Republicans and many Democrats do like people. I think that also that there is a difference, of course, between these extremely offensive, truly despicable videos and now cartoons uh, that have been shown. The, the video um, is offensive to almost all of us. People, everybody that I talk to is itched, and many of the people are not Muslims, but we are outraged at this kind of uh, despicable video. It can be made, uh, you know, it's freedom of the speech, of speech, and that's an important principle most of us feel. Occupy Movement, fortunately, has made many videos, and those also are up and very public to see. So the equivalent is, yes, all of these groups can make videos and do make some of them. Some of them are atrocious, and yet they are still there to be seen. 
the video was not, you know, it's portrayed as ma being made by, quote, the U.S. Um, it's, I, I think that's a bit incorrect. It was not made by the U.S. It was made by one or two somewhat mysterious individuals. We know very little of their background, of their funding, etc. So this is a, you know, a very disturbing thing that has not surprisingly created enormous outrage, um, both in the United States and in the Middle East. In terms of these wars that the U.S. keeps getting pushed into, Amer the American public is not pro-war. If you look at surveys again and again, over many decades, including previous wars, you consistently find that Americans do not want to engage in warfare. Diplomatic uh, measures are always preferable and usually much more successful. Uh, they, they don't result in massive loss of life, destruction, and the kind of destruction not only abroad but to Americans as well. Certain powerful interests push wars. Um, it is those powerful interests that push the wars that often fund the political campaigns in this country and in other countries. Those need to be opposed and are being opposed. I do feel that we have potentially, we have a real democracy in this country when enough people vote. I saw change in, in my lifetime, I've seen major change. I saw the Vietnam War ended. Many people worked for change in South Africa. I saw the laws in the, in the South that I lived under for a while that were apartheid laws. I saw that change. Uh, things are far from perfect. All of those incidents I mentioned are not, you know, we're not perfect. But I have seen people in this country bring major change when enough of us become aware active and vote on our conscience, consciences, uh, not the lesser evilism that many people vote on these days. So I think we do have a real democracy when we practice it, but there are powerful, extremely uh, financially successful interests that are trying to subvert that democracy, and too often those powerful interests are successful. Now in terms of Netanyahu and Obama who's calling the shots, Israel consistently calls the shots on American policy. I have just done an article that looks at the last 100 years of the pro-Israel movement in the United States that documents how consistently Israel is, is, the tail is wagging the dog in this particular issue. Other issues, it is the, the, the usual suspects that are driving U.S. policies. In the Middle East, Israel is driving the policies. And that is possible to do, as we've seen, if you are a small interest group that is focusing on an issue, putting major amounts of money into that issue, and if most of the rest of the country are not paying attention, if there is not a powerful mm -hmm. interest group on the other side that is countering it, and that's the case, then a little tiny interest group, in this case one on behalf of Israel, will call the shots, right. has done that, and continues to do that today. Okay, since we're talking about democracy, Michael Preisner, it, there's something fundamentally wrong, uh, and, and I don't know if you agree, when you look up the website of the U.S. governments, and that was the case in Egypt and also in Libya, and I believe in Tunisia also, where there are actually manuals that uh, were set out in so many words to show the people within each respective country how to practice democracy. Isn't there something fundamentally wrong in trying to teach people of each country how to practice democracy when each culture perhaps is different, different dynamics involved, etc.? Well, I think we need to cut through the rhetoric here. Uh, the U.S. likes to use the word democracy um, to mean something, you know, as, as they want people to believe, meaning the right of freedom of expression, the right to uh, democratically elect your leader, uh, and things like that. You know, what we're taught to believe they mean by democracy. Um, but as we've, you know, just said, the democracy or so-called democracy we have in this country not really being a model uh, that we want to see around the world where it's just the very, very, very richest people with billions and many millions of dollars who dominate completely the political scene and the political establishment. Um, that doesn't seem like the type of democracy we want to recommend for other people in the world. But what the U.S. government means by democracy when they're talking about teaching these other countries 
uh, how to be free and how to have liberty. Uh, what it really is coming down to, uh, the freedom they talk about, isn't the freedom of people to live in dignity and live with humanity and live in peace and, and live with respect. They're talking about the freedom of U.S. corporations and U.S. banks uh, to have unfettered access to the markets of these countries, to the labor of these countries, to the natural resources of these countries. If a country says we are independent and that we will develop our own industry, we will develop our own resources, we will, we will uh, resources, we will set our own labor laws, we will set our own pay wages, we will use the wealth of this country uh, for what we want to use it for. Uh, that is seen as refusing to acquiesce to the demands of the very rich and the very powerful. Um, and as a result, they say that that country is not free because they are not allowing the freedom of the big banks and corporations in the United States to completely plunder their economies. That's okay, really what they mean Okay, we're going to have to unfortunately leave it there. They I do apologize. Thank you very much, Michael Price, an Iraq War veteran there. also like to thank Executive Director of If Americans Knew, Allison Weir, and also writer and political commentator Lawrence Freeman. And thank you for watching another edition of the Press TV News Analysis. Any questions or comments, newsroom at presstv.ir is our email address. From Mikovitahwe and the entire team in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye.